Good evening, and welcome to Write America. I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversation each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Roger Rosenblatt, the esteemed writer and creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome, and please join us regularly every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other, and with you, in an effort to bring us together. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a special edition of Write America with Norman Lear and Roger Rosenblatt in conversation. I will return afterwards to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you who are not familiar with Crowdcast, let me show you a couple of features. The chat is to your right. Please keep conversing throughout the evening. The questions, however, are at the bottom of the page. You'll see a tab that says ask a question. That's where I'm going to go for your questions at the end of the evening. Three, there is a buy button at the bottom for books that are from Bird's Books written by both of these authors. Now for a little more on our speakers. Norman Lear is the creator or co-creator and television producers of such groundbreaking sitcoms as All in the Family, Sanford and Son, One Day at a Time, The Jeffersons, Good Times, and Maud. He has received a Peabody, the National Medal of Arts, four Emmy Awards, and has the distinction of being the oldest person ever to win an Emmy his most recent just a couple of years ago for live in front of a studio audience. He is the subject of the PBS American Masters episode, Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You, which premiered October 2016 and is currently streaming on Netflix. He is a television and film writer-producer whose dynamic career in Hollywood has encompassed both the golden age and streaming era. At 99, Norman Lear has no plans to retire. He is the executive producer of the 2021 documentary, Rita Moreno, Just a Girl Who Decided to Go For It, which premiered at Sundance. Lear is an executive producer on the critically acclaimed feature film, I Carry You With Me. He is also executive producing a reimagined and animated Good Times for Netflix. His social and political activism extend beyond the messaging of his programs, and he continues to be a strong advocate for civic duty and progressive American values. A World War II combat veteran and outspoken activist, Norman Lear founded People for the American Way, a progressive advocacy organization. He lives in Los Angeles. Roger Rosenblatt is the author of five New York Times notable books and three Times bestsellers, including memoirs Kayak Morning and Making Toast. He's written seven off-Broadway plays, including Free Speech in America, named one of the Times 10 best plays of 1991, and Lives in the Basement Does Nothing, his one-person play about the writing life, for which he played, played jazz piano. The distinguished professor of English and writing at Stony Brook University, he formerly held the Briggs Copeland appointment in teaching of writing at Harvard. Among his honors are two George Polk Awards, the Peabody and the Emmy for his essays at Time Magazine and on PBS, a Fulbright to Ireland where he played on the Irish international basketball team, seven honorary doctorates, and the Kenyon Review Award for Lifetime Literary Achievement. Please welcome Norman Lear and Roger Rosenblatt to the screen. Hello. We're getting there. There we are. Hey. hey. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> so happy to see you. So happy to see happier to see you, Roger. Uh, it took, it took me a lot of years to get to more years to get to it. 
um, the, the rich riddle be because of that. The, uh, um, by the way, before we got on, the Guinness uh, Book of World Records called me. We set the record for the oldest people together, the, the to total number of age ever to talk to each other. We are, we, we are 180 years old. Uh, uh, the we broke the record of Methuselah and Georgie Jessel. <laughs> Methuselah two, and Georgie Jessel <laughs> by two by two years. I am so happy to see you. Um, the, one, particularly on Right America, because Right America, I I realize is a owes so much to people for the American way, and the with the same impulses uh, of trying to reach the best part of this country, and the. Um, uh, our, our effort through uh, writing and literature was your efforts through uh, politics and works in the work in the schools. But would you tell us how people for the American way came to you, the idea and how it's doing now? Oh, it's doing very well now. I'll cover that first. It's uh, it has a new chairman. Uh, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 months. It could be a year. Ben Jealous is his name. Uh, he is a fabulous guy who spent 12 years running, uh, the, uh, ACLU and, uh, NAACP, I beg your pardon, NAACP. Uh, but he could have done both at the same time. He's that brilliant. And, uh, a lot of years ago, gosh, I don't even remember how many years ago it was. I was made very nervous and concerned as an American about uh, a, a, a two religious leaders uh, on the crazy far right, as I think of it, uh, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson. <laughs> the mixture of politics and religion has been anathema to me so disturbing to me from very early uh, in my life when I was, I don't know, 12, 13. There was a preacher on television, Father Coughlin was his name. You have to be somewhat near my age to remember him. But he was on radio and he had a big audience and he was uh, viciously anti-Semitic. And uh, anti uh, uh, Negro, African American. It was a dreadful guy. My father had gone, to, uh, got into some trouble and was hauled off to prison. Maybe a week after he and I had discovered Coglin on the radio. So with my father away and this guy in my ear, uh, I could never forget it. Mm. And that a, a, an American, a, uh, people from the American way came out of my head some years later when I was concerned, as I said, about Paul Will and Robertson, et cetera. Uh, no surprise. I carried Codwin with me. I do to this minute. The impulses are similar, um, but not the same, which makes Right America a fit companion to and sequel to People for. The, it came into um, my thoughts of the night that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris sat down and said, we are president and vice president. They said it. And the reason they had to say that was because of the malicious mischief that was done by Trump saying that the election had been rigged and that he was uh, he was, in fact, the president that night, as in other times with uh, um, all over the country, there were riots. And I mean, riots such as I have not seen in civil rights or Vietnam or any of the social issues before. And the country was clearly and has been and continues to be so divided, largely, I think, because Donald Trump exposed a kind of uh, dreadful nerve in the country. A, uh, it's one thing to be a monster. It's another thing to loose the monsters. 
And the uh, once you see that happen with the divisions in the country, I thought, what can writers do? Can writers do anything? And I thought, well, we can do our stuff. We can show in the quality of our writing and the thoughts and talks and feelings that emerge uh, from our writing that people are together, not apart, that we belong together, we are the same animal. And so <laughs> it's, a, it's a fitting companion to people for the American way. I couldn't agree more. I feel the same way about it in terms of the uh, uh, our efforts in television and so forth have matched what you're talking about. And I, I, don't, it, I grew up at a time, at 99, I, I grew up at a time when we were so in love with what America meant, uh, what the founders, the way the founders described it. And uh, as I say that, I worry that anybody think we were uh, patting ourselves on the back or we were being, you know, uh, annoying or loudmouth or so uh, flattering or it was just deep in us. I mean, it, I will never forget standing on the corner, New Haven, Connecticut with my grandfather, watching uh, a, a parade on Veterans Day or the 4th of July or uh, always, I'm talking about a small town parade, but people were lined up on the sidewalks, just proud to be reminded of, uh, of uh, what we built for ourselves and in a sense gave to the world. You, you, you took a copy, bought a copy and moved around the country with a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Yeah. It, it, the uh, it's what a wonderful inspired idea uh, that was, but in fact, we uh, when we talk about Norman Lear, uh, we talk about a man of so many parts that we want to make sure that we touch on them all. You have brought such laughter to the country, such roaring laughter to the, to the country through through uh, TV and through the sitcoms and satire, and I I guess what I wonder is what. Is laughter, um, does laughter have anything to do with social improvement? Or does it just stand by itself and people enjoy themselves? No, I think there is nothing that knits us together. People of, you know, of great diversity than sitting together uh, laughing. Being brought to a smile and a laugh by something human that is occurring that knits us because we all find the same joy and, and finding that joy together. You know, there's uh, for the hundreds of times I have stood aside, everything I ever did was in front of a live audience. All the shows were live audience. So I had the life-giving joy of, uh, of standing to the side and watching 250, 300 people laughing as one <laughs> on, a, on a guffaw. You, you're watching a couple of hundred people come out of that chair and go forward with a laugh and then uh -huh. come back. And I tell you, Roger, that wave, there is nothing more spiritual, more deeply uh, touching in in a an all embracing way than an audience laughing together. Do you remember the Joel McRae movie Sullivan's Travels? I do. Okay, so you remember that Joel McRae was a great Hollywood director of comedies, and he started to abrade himself for only doing comedies. He thought these were slight and unimportant, so he was going to dress as a hobo and find his way into uh, real America, real poor uh, and downtrodden America. He gets hit on the head. He winds up in a chain gang and he is with the misery of the country. And he is quite miserable himself. And everybody in Hollywood thinks he's dead. And then this group is drawn out to a movie. They have a movie once a night in a local church. And 
Mickey Mouse is on the screen and he sees his, all his fellow convicts and all, just laughing and laughing and laughing. And he realizes that what he had been doing originally was important, in fact, that he got, he got the world to laugh almost against the, the very world that was conspiring against them. I, I, I love that. And I, I'm very touched by what that has meant to you so obviously through all the years. Well, we we um, uh, we both know what's funny, um, and the the uh, the beauty, the way you describe the beauty of a com of people la getting together and laughing. But then you have Archie Bunker, okay? So we laughed at Archie Bunker. I was never sure Ar laughed at Archie Bunker with Archie Bunker. Michael Arlen said something when All in the Family came out. Michael Arlen, writing in the New Yorker, uh, uh, wrote um, Norman Lear has a feel for what people want to see before they know they want to see it. <laughs> can you, can you have, a, have a higher compliment than that? And I, Michael Arlen is a dear friend of mine. He does not give compliments uh, uh, easily. So uh, the, uh, that really means something. But I want to read something because we're talking about writing. You are, you are a first-class writer and a first-class storyteller. I'm just going to read a paragraph uh, from the wonderful memoir, even this I get to experience. And it has to do with Archie Bunker. And I want to, on the other side, I want to ask you something about creating Archie Bunker today. For the next eight years, Carol, that is Carol O'Connor, Carol would continue to dislike every script, every script at the start. It was nothing but fear and blind anger was his only defense. Certainly he bettered many a scene with it, but he needn't have taken his belligerent, belligerence to get there. The marvel of Carol's performance as Archie Bunker was that at some point each week, deep in the rehearsal process, he seemed to pass through a membrane, on one side of which was the actor Carol O'Connor, and on the other side, the character Archie Bunker. Fully into the role of Archie, he was easily the best writer of dialogue we had for character. He was a full-fledged version of the New York cab driver he'd patterned, patterned himself after. As he told me at the beginning, as difficult and often abusive as Carol could be, his Archie made up for it, and I could kiss his feet after every performance. If Carol O'Connor hadn't played Archie Bunker, jails wouldn't be a detergent to crime. New York would not be a smelting pot. Living would not be a question of feast or salmon, and there would be no, <laughs> <laughs> and there would be no medical specialty known as groin ecology. <laughs> all funny beyond things but now right. they were they were all expressions i hope it's clear that were coined by, by the him. actor playing the role yeah Ama it was amazing stuff but would archie bunker survive today would you write archie bunker today i would write oh well, i don't know if it would, would be the same archie bunker but certainly but if, if, if it, there, there, it would seem to me that the Archie Bunker, who, who was always, we were always able to laugh at and with in spite of disagreeing with everything he said, it was all sort of that we are part of the same family, all in the same family. Now, mm -hmm. there are so many divisions and so many divisions played on and so much cruelty that has been uh, uh, made public and made policy. Um, I, th I thought we'd have an Archie Bunker, but would he be as funny? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm asked about that all the time. Uh, what did you just say? You used policy and funny in the same word? No, I mean, if you're asking sense. me ever to remember what I just said, we're going to stop talking right here. <laughs> no, but but... The the the, uh, the 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 idea that we live in in a time with so many more hard edges uh, all around than than uh, uh, than when Archie and, and we do. came into being. I think we were dealing with what I call the uh, I think of as the uh, foolishness of the human condition. Yes, which exists everywhere in this conversation. You know. We're, uh, we're a couple of ordinary fellows who've had uh, some luck in this life, maybe a little smarter than some, less smart than others, are sitting here 
talking to how many hundreds of thousands or millions of people uh, as if as if we thought they gave a shit. <laughs> and I don't know. And so you can't wake up uh, uh, understanding life without understanding the foolishness of the human condition. It's it, you did so much with it, you know. You you made funny so much funnier. You've known so many funny people in your life. Uh, I have known the, the, my the, share of funny people. Uh, the uh, uh, you standing proudly among them, but um, the uh, Carl Reiner. Oh, I miss him. I only left us only a few months ago. Uh, no, I, you know, I've laughed with some extraordinary Bert Lars and W.C. Fields and Carl Reiner's and uh, Mel Brooks. And, oh God, and Mel Darling Brooks. You know, a lot of years ago, a fellow who owned uh, Caesar's Palace. Uh, and I knew one another, and he called me one day, and he said, you know, Norman, uh, we have two uh, uh, homes, one in Las Vegas, one in Palm Springs, and one at uh, La Costa. They're five bedrooms. Uh, they're fully staffed, and we have them for high rollers. I know you're not a high roller, but... Uh, I want to tell you that some weekends are not available. All you have to do is call my office. Called his office one day, and the one in Palm Springs was available. Nobody was there over that particular weekend. And I invited Carl and Mel, Tom DeLuise, uh, Larry Gelbart, who is the funniest of the comedy writers ever, uh, Five, these five couples. And that became something that we did once or twice a year for about seven years. Uh, and we called ourselves uh, Yiddish expression, Yenemvelt, which means uh, the other world. <laughs> uh, and Carl wrote a song. Uh, no, Larry Gilbert wrote the song. Came out of a dressing room, uh, out of a bedroom one day, with a sheet of paper, which had the uh, lyrics, because he needed a sheet, this sheet of paper that he had written down. <laughs> <laughs> and the song was Oh Yenemvelt, Oh Yenemvelt, Oh Yenemvelt, Oh Yenemvelt, Oh Yenemvelt. Oh Oh, yeah, no, no, no. How could you remember the lyrics? I, that, that's why he wrote them down. <laughs> talk, talk, talk to us about Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Those who remember that were all, it's another stunner. I mean, it, and, and so, as Michael Arlen said, so seeing what we wanted to see before we knew what we wanted to see it. And there, the satire seemed to be television itself. Is that right? Uh, well, no, not television. It, it was, uh, I remember speaking of it as, uh, well, it was about television. It was about the media's effect on an average housewife. Right. And television was the largest part of that. Oh, Raji, you remember that better than I. Two, but if you uh, put the two of us together, we'll remember three or four things. It's wonderful. <laughs> and Louise Lasser, who, uh, I mean, you know, it's so interesting. I write the character. I don't really know what I have in mind. I have something in mind that I can't describe, really, except the scenes she's in. <laughs> and then you do a casting, you know, call and, you, you know, 30 women are a part, same thing for Archie Bunker, on both coasts. And uh, 
Louise Lasso walks in one day and sits down, and before she's finished the first page, you've discovered. You didn't write it so much as discover it. There she is, Mary Hartman. She, it, there he was, Archie Buck. And they were breathtaking choices. Nobody, they be, they became the the so fully the characters that you could see them almost becoming themselves yeah. as they performed. They, uh, you know, it's, uh, I find myself resisting the word choices. They were the people. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Yes. <laughs> they were choices. They were the characters. Right. They, wa they walked in. <laughs> Gore Vidal, Gore Vidal said something. Um, I think you, you gave him a part, a small part in Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. And he said to Mary Hartman, um, if a book were written about America, it would be about you. Uh, all, the, all the vulnerabilities and all the beauties of it, too. I'm paraphrasing what, what he said. Yeah, uh, it was a wonderful thing to say, and and so smart, um, and absolutely true. That's why she held our attention. You know, it, she seemed so vulnerable at the same time, uh, so important. Garbadal, uh, some he had a, he was in Italy. He lived there for many years, and uh, friends kept sending him copies of uh, of Mary Hartman. And finally, I, I didn't know Gore. I heard from him through some mutual friend, and he wanted to come to America to be on Mary Hartman. I have to have Mary Hartman in my life, I remember him saying. <laughs> and so we wrote a part for him as Gore Vidal, and he was in, you know, um, the hook. The town and somehow happened, and uh, and he was absolutely wonderful. That happened too with Orson Welles. Orson he, Welles, really? Yes, yes. Ah. <laughs> Orson Welles was in Mary Hartman. Uh, he was a Mary Hart. Was it <laughs> amazing? I heard from him, and he came to Los Angeles. I'll never forget it because when he came to the office, like the whole lot, we were on the Paramount lot. <laughs> there were a, you know, a couple of hundred people trying to get into our office to be in the same room with Orson Welles. I can I can imagine so many so many things of a life of so many achievements, so many things you have made. And yet somehow your life seems larger than the things that you've done, which is saying something. It is more important, uh, more valuable, more lasting. The, um, has there been anything that you have not done that you would want to have done? No women, please just talk straight. <laughs> um, uh... I, I, the answer is no, but but there's so much behind that. You know, there, there are two little words we don't pay enough attention to, over and next. Mm. When something is over, it's, can, I, can you swear here, really swear? Because <laughs> I always say, it was, I, I, the way yes. I think it is, when something is over, it's fucking over, and we are on to next. And if there was a hammock in the middle between those two words, it would be the best definition of living in the moment. What a nice thought, and what a perfect so, image. And I, I, I think I live to live in the moment. I wake up to live in the moment. Living in the moment for you has always seemed to be uh, the definition of useful. I once talked to Lewis Thomas, the great doctor, biologist, and author of Lives of a Cell, and when he was dying, actually, and uh, he had said to me, I only hope that I have what I have done is useful, that my life has been useful. Mm -hmm. uh, it, se it seems to me exactly what is in your mind, too, in the hammock or outside the hammock, that it was an absolutely useful life. And continues I, to be. I, there is, um, I, I can't imagine anything more I would wish to hear than that. Well, yeah, the, uh, I, I, I have thought 
as we have talked about the wonders of life in a sense uh, that I, I, I can't let this conversation go without mentioning six children that, uh, and, uh, and my wife, Lynn. Please talk about it. I don't have the words to express the way they fill me. What and each of them as human beings, as a son, one son, five daughters, uh, their personalities, their weight in the moment and uh, in my life, it's, uh, they're great. They are great. I have the joy of knowing several of them and the, uh, um, at every stage that I've, that I've had the chance to, uh, to know them, they were beautiful children. They were beautiful young adults. They are beautiful adults. I love hearing that. And, uh, I don't have to say any more about it, but <laughs> I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't imagine this conversation without mentioning them and, and Lynn. And I, I was saying of Lynn before we went, uh, before we came on, I remember Lynn years ago, years ago, being so prescient about climate, uh, the dangers uh, of, uh, 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 to the climate. She was way ahead of everybody. She was, uh, it was very early. She's the one that uh, turned me on to the problem. I mean, everybody knew, but, being turned on to it is, is different from acknowledging it exists. And she was turned on to it early, yeah. The, the wonderful thing that I've uh, had the joy and the privilege, the honor of your friendship uh, all these years is to see how unsolemn you are with solemn subjects. These, the, um, uh, the importance of people for the American way, the importance of the Declaration of Independence, the importance of knowing what a being an American is and should be. All of such things sound like as if they're going to be delivered by uh, Father Mapple in Moby Dick and be a, a, a terrible <laughs> sermon and scare and scare us to death. But you have had something uh, built in you. It's almost like a chip uh, that said, I will make this palatable. I will make this fun. I will, I will, I will. I will express uh, my love for people rather than my fear. Well, you know, I don't, it all started when, as I mentioned earlier, my father was uh, got into trouble. And or did I mention this earlier? You started to, uh, but go on. And, and he was hauled off to prison for three years. And uh, I lived with an uncle and an uncle and an uncle and then my grandparents for the couple of years. Uh, what did I start to say there? About I mean, your father? It, 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 uh, I'm, uh, I wanted to get to another story and I forgot the story I wanted to get to. My father... It, he came out in three. <laughs> it came out. He was served three years at Deer Island in, off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, I met him. Uh, I was in New Haven with my grandparents. He came through New Haven on the New York, uh, uh, New Haven Hartford Railroad. On his way to New York to pick up, and he picked up my mother, my sister, and me. And sitting with me, just out of prison, on the way to New York, he said to me, well, Norman, you're going to be by Bedford in three years. I was, I was, I guess I was 10. Uh, for your by Mitzvah, I'm going to take you and your mother and your sister for a trip around the world. We'll be gone a year. Exactly that. I could never forget it including we'll be gone a year this was a man just out of prison didn't have a quarter to his name we were going to new york as it turned out i didn't know at that moment 
to live with another couple and their two kids for the months it took for him to get a job. And then the... You are, if I'm saying you are frozen for the moment. And um, I remember something that you had said about your grandfather also, uh, how much he loved this country and writing to, uh, to Roosevelt with a letter that began, dear, my dear, darling, Mr. President, and then went on to criticize something that had been done. I hope Cindy, that we can get Norman back if the, um, uh, but in the, uh, but in the meantime, it is, um, uh, it's a, it's such a joy, uh, to see you, uh, and to, uh, hear about this important life, important life. The, what Gore Vidal said to Mary Hartman about if there were a book about America, that book would be about you. Uh, people could say uh, about you, Norman. If there were a book about America, that book would be about you. Uh, loving the country, but loving the country with as much severity and intelligence as passion. And that uh, that is a rare, rare gift, a gift that you, uh, that you wind up giving to others. The, uh, before we came, there you are. Yeah. Sorry, okay. power outage. Sorry, we had a power outage. Uh, well, you, the, the power is back on and, um, and, 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 uh, uh, we're all glad to see you. You were say, saying about your father. I remembered your grandfather had written a letter to Roosevelt. My uh, dearest son. My dear starling he, he, Mr. President. Yeah, he wrote a lot of letters to them. Each, <laughs> one had, each one began the same way. My dear starling Mr. President. Uh, it's great. And, you know, the, the, the feeling of the closeness to the country, the, the closeness of the principles of the country mattered, particularly to immigrants, uh, mm -hmm. not solely to immigrants, not exclusively to immigrants, to be sure, but certainly it's, particularly it's, immigrants. It's something we had when I was a boy. Uh, the biggest of the, 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 the most important of the presidential leaders was FDR through those years. And the country had a father then. Wow. And I have always felt, despite my age and everything else, I need a father, a father in the White House. And he could be 30 years old and still right. be a father in the White House. Uh, and we need one so much now. Boy, do we. The uh, As for as much protection as wisdom. What are and you up I, to? I'm sorry, I didn't I, to interrupt you. I, I was going to ask what you're doing now. What new project? Uh, I have a young partner named Brent Miller. He's in his mid-40s. He's just the dearest, most talented guy. And... Uh, uh, this side of Roger Rosenblatt. And uh, so we've been a company together for some years, about six, eight years. And uh, we've done a lot of things. And we're now uh, doing an animated uh, version of Good Times. Uh, we're going to do uh, another Mary Hartman because... They want it out there. And we've got a couple. We're doing, a, we did a show last year with all, we did an episode of All in the Family and uh, the Jeffersons with a new cast in each one. Hey, that's great. I, I forget the title. It was, two, it was uh, you know, two half hours since an hour. And we're doing another one. We, 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 can't, we can't give the names of the I'm not supposed to talk about it. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and she, stopped, she stopped me just in time. Everybody we're doing, it. we're doing Cindy. something like that again. <laughs> Everyone needs a Cindy. You're not supposed to talk about it, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's what you were mentioning with appreciation, the people who work with you. Um, and uh, I have uh, Alice, whom you've met here, uh, Lindsay, who works with me, and Rachel, who works with me. And the, the, um, the blessings of uh, companionship 
in something that people believe in are uh, um, uh, uh, something uh, something that people rarely talk about, but it's such a gift. It's such it's such a prize. It is. It is. And you know, I am so benefited in every way from those associations, and I hope those associations all feel the same way. We, you know, it's been a great life as a collaboration. And certainly our work is a giant collaboration. That's a wonderful thing that life is a collaboration. Yes, it, uh, yes, it is. And it's particularly uh, chastening to writers. Uh, we live a solitary life. One, one of the things that pleased me about Write America and getting going, you know, it started with a few writers. Now it's up to 119. Uh, That's writers. fabulous, Roger. And they're all great. I mean, these are all really first-rate writers and first-rate people. Writers aren't naturally social. If 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 we if we move towards our instincts, we just be uh, monks uh, hiding, sending out the pages, and and uh, holding our breath. But for this, for something that said what we do has to do with um, being human, uh, identifying what is human in us, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, we we come together. And every week, I watch. Uh, these wonderfully, wonderfully talented people talk about what they do, read what they do, uh, and discover in each other uh, someone worthwhile. That's fabulous. You, you want to take that number, did you say 119? Yes, sir. Can we make it 120? Oh, you've already made it 119. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> there was no way I'm letting you out of this. No, 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 no. <laughs> and our our common our our friend in common, Alan Bergman, the wonderful lyricist. He uh, uh he is with us. And and I thought I'd get Alan in there because he's only ninety five. Uh, he's a boy. He's a kid. He's a boy. <laughs> Alan and Marilyn Bergman. I, every, they've written every piece of music I've ever, you know, they wrote the, uh, those were the days for all on the family. Yes. They, all, all the theme songs we've done, the Jeffersons moving on up. And, and outside that, the way we were, uh, oh. um, the what loveliest love song, but the, I don't know, but for three or four of Barbara Streisand's major songs. Absolutely. Are the Bergmans. It's a perfect marriage of talent, uh, hers and uh, hers and theirs. And what what a and what and what a privilege to know them. You know what a privilege to watch them work. Alan Alan said to me um, that he hears the words in the music, uh, which is a wonderful thing to say. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of writers, including myself, hear the music in the words, but the, the, and you do too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the idea of putting these words together and then the words are attached to people and then people are saying the words and suddenly you've created a life, which is what you did again and again. Well, we've all done, that's what, that's what we do as writers. I said when you were, uh, uh, absent for a minute or so, that what Gore Vidal had said to Mary Hartman, one may say to you in a different context, when he said, if a book were written about America, it would be about you. Uh, and if a book were written about America, it would be about you, Norman. Uh, I don't see that <laughs> at all. You're not supposed to um, see it. <laughs> I, I, I don't see that at all. It would be about us. Although all not, all not. of us. And, and all of the us's that pre-existed us by uh, hundreds of years. The um, we come to a, a part of our show where Alice joins us or rejoins us with questions, and here she is now. Um, I'm here. So I am uh, uh, Alice. Uh, either ask away from something that the audience asked or yourself. Uh, both, but I also would like to say, Norman, I know, has a cover of the book that's not coming out until November 2nd, and I'd love to see it. Oh, Because yeah. we I don't do. have I it do, yet. I do, I do, I do, I do, and there it is. Oh, it's beautiful. All in the family. What a stunner. 
It great was song. Beautiful. Yeah. You're uh, singing Jim my Co- song. Perfect for the holidays. <laughs> the, 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 I don't know, Roger. Do you know Jim Colucci? Uh, no, a, I do not. I do he's not. A, a journalist, wonderful writer, and I love the book he did. Well, it it looks gorgeous. Congratulations, and just not to be Thank outdone. You. Here's oh, Roger. Yes. Uh, I have to. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I always like to on every occasion <laughs> possible. <laughs> um, the congratulations, part. Roger. <laughs> and thank you, Alice. Well, what is um, that? Number 13? Number 20. No, number, number 20. Woohoo. I Imagine. have a question from Denise Howe. Anger seems to be the emotion of this time. I believe hope is active voice. How do we learn to laugh again? That's for you, Norman. Wow. How do we learn to laugh again? I, I don't think we stopped laughing. I think we have lost the uh, measure of importance it is in our lives. Uh, there was a time, I mean, certainly when we were doing our shows, when people came to laugh, I don't know where they're going to laugh, or they're good, they're doing it, but they're not thinking about, I came here to laugh. Hmm. They're not hmm. thinking about, I'm laughing with strangers, which unites us. Right. Uh, the next question that I have is, please discuss your copy or ownership of the Declaration of Independence, the history and where it is now. Do that. You know, I can't tell you where it is now because the person who purchased it from me some years ago uh, wished to be anonymous. So I don't know oh. uh, who has it now. But uh my wife and I, I remember the moment so clearly. We were walking in, we happened to be in New York, we were walking down the street, and uh, I had a newspaper, and uh, I don't know what prompted me, I would, maybe we were looking up the, for an address or something, and, but I came across an ad that said the uh, Sotheby's had a copy there were 13 copies, I forget now the name of this copy, of extant in the world of the Declaration of Independence. And I said to my wife, I want to follow up on this and see if we can buy it. And uh, so that, that's how that happened. Uh, when I bought it, uh, I knew that uh, I, well, I, before I bought it, the reason I bought it was I wanted to travel it. I knew that, that people in 50 states would love to see this document. And, uh, oh, I've lost his name. But anyway, somebody came up with a great deal of money. Oh. I can't remember that. This is what 99 will do to you. <laughs> uh, but this gorgeous man on a Sunday morning, he came to, he had two sons that were looking at colleges and he was in Los Angeles. Was it Dunlap? Was that Dunlap? Dunlap. Dunlap copies. They were, you know, uh, down the street from uh, Constitution Hall where it was uh, written. There was a uh, printer uh, named John Dunlap. And they took it down there and they made those Dunlap copies. A hundred copies they made, which they sent by horseback across the 13 colonies. Uh, I love that history. It's I did too. There was the fellow they got to write the Constitution probably couldn't read, and he but he had beautiful handwriting and he wrote out the Constitution. And I always thought he was this 
farmer, really, a German farmer, writing the Constitution, the class document of all democracies, writing the Constitution. By the way, we talk about that. We're talking about the Declaration of Independence. Right. The Const Constitution was a came later. Yeah, it did come. It did come later. Yeah. But that all both all these documents were meant for the little guy. For the little woman, for it's somebody so who was who was who was anonymous and who would then um, become uh, not part of the country, would become the country. Love the way you put that. Yes, so true. Patricia asked, "What are you most proud of having done or achieved?" My kids come to mind quickly. <laughs> I've got six glorious kids. Um, I don't know. I what's the most proud? I I loved Maud. I loved Beatrice Arthur and Carol O'Connor. Uh, you know, I had a difficult time with Carol. He had a difficult time with Norman. Uh, but I loved him and what he brought to my life, the character. Uh, he, when he passed, uh, I was with a number of others at his home and uh, his wife, who is also passed now, but was there then and, and she said, please stay, everybody's leaving shortly and uh, I want to show you something. And uh, before he died, we had a, a difficult time about something i don't know i mean something related to the show and uh when everybody left she took me she opened she unlocked the door to his study took me into his study and his desk was bare but for one page and it was a letter i had written them six years earlier about how much despite what we were going through, how much I loved and was grateful for his Archie Bunker. Uh, and that was on his desk. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm. Well, gentlemen, I have one additional question and I want to hear stories because I want to know I, wait, how wait, I, want another, I want another three hours of this. Okay. Well, then talk about how the two of you met. I want to know how you, the two right, of you uh, met. How did, we, uh, how did we meet? I, I actually, I remember how we met. Do you remember Andrew High School? Oh, God, yes. Okay. Well, Andrew High School uh, said to me, Andrew High School, I should say, was the uh, chairman of the board of Time, Inc. Um, wonderful fellow, monumental uh, fellow. Monumental. Big, 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 big in every way. Um, magnanimous, and he was a big man, and well, anyway, he said, Norman Lear wants to meet you. Um, and uh, that was enough for a lifetime for me. So uh, we went to lunch with Norman, and um, we've been eating lunch ever since. I wanted to meet him because I read something. That, you, and I, I, Andrew had read it, too. We talked about it or something, and I said, I'd love to meet him. Somebody, I mean, right. Have we talked enough about what a glorious writer and thinker this man is? Oh, well, you, you, this is your thing, so they know. So we met, that's how we met Alice. And the, uh, and uh, there have been, there have been so, there's been so much uh, fun uh, uh, since. And um, <laughs> We we once we uh, Norman has a beautiful place in Vermont that once belonged to Robert Frost, and Norman and I sequestered ourselves one afternoon and watched Doctor Strangelove three times. The, <laughs> <laughs> we we just couldn't get we could not get enough of it. Oh, that's priceless. That's priceless. Well, we're wrapping up, and I don't see other questions here. Is there something that you would like to share with us, Norman? What do you want to tell the people here? There's so many writers in this group that are here that uh, have come tonight. 
I can, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is to share uh, my love for this moment. I mean, we just spent an hour plus together, just perfect, perfectly lovely. Uh, so lovely, I forget I'm talking about myself. <laughs> uh, just looking at the two of you and having a conversation. And, uh, it's my honor, sir. I, I've loved it. I love this man and, and could not admire him more. I, I love this man and could not admire him more. And I'm so grateful, uh, not only that you're in my life, which is inconsequential, but that you're in everybody's life, that you have <laughs> permeated uh, uh, through television, through your writing, through your personality, through your ambitions for the country. You've just made the place better. Very few people can say thank, that. Thank, thank you. We are one. Well, on that well, note, on that note Jeff, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm no, I was going to say we are one, and bless you for pulling this together, Roger, to be continued. Always. Always to be continued. Gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up tonight, and I hate to even say goodbye, uh, but it has been just near and dear to my heart to be here. Alice, thank uh, you for sorry. hosting us. We're so grateful to you. Oh, you're so welcome, yes. and it's my honor. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to minimize each of you and just give a couple of quick sign-offs. I think all of us will agree that we have witnessed something exceptional tonight, and I thank you all for joining us. At the end of the day, there will be a recording of this if you want to come back and visit it again, which I know that I will. The authors have written books, and we will carry them, but it was the experience of this evening that was exceptional. So thank you for joining us. Have a pleasant evening. <laughs>